thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. So uh, as the title uh, says, I'll talk about three rather distinct uh, objects which somehow turn to how to converge in uh, rather concrete ways and, and, and to which generated, I think, some interesting obje new objects. And one of the things that's spinning on the slide is uh, a limit set, which in some sense encodes some Hodge theory. So I'll try to maybe explain how, how these things arise. But before I uh, talk about all of these sort of complicated objects, I'll begin with giving you the one version of the main theorem, which is, is very short and has the advantage that it should be clear to a calculus student, and you can state it in three lines. So I'll uh, just give you the, the, the three lines. So w this is uh, the first half of the first line. So you can consider this power series. It has some radius of convergence, psi zero. You might recognize this function from uh, a variety of uh, sort of classical topics. Maybe in the 19th century, it was probably more recognizable than the 21st. But it's a function. It's psi zero. And then you consider psi one, which uh, is another function of a similar flavor, uh, like psi zero. Uh, you'll note that it has a logarithmic term. So uh, there's this log t. And you should think of t as a complex variable. So log t, in particular, has some monodromy. As it goes around zero, uh, it accumulates uh, 2 pi i. That's two functions. So if you have two functions, you can create something that's called the Ronskian. So you can, this is basically a determinant of a matrix whose columns are the function and its derivative. And so this is an expression. And then you consider yet another function. Here it is, lambda of q. Uh, so Q is now a new variable. Q is of absolute value less than 1. And the theorem is that the following composition of these two functions never vanishes. So it's never 0. So that's a kind of a mysterious looking statement about power series. Uh, to convince you that at least some of these functions are not completely uh, random, so uh, I can relatively easily explain what is the function lambda. So lambda is a function that I think everybody here knows that it exists, but you might have not seen it uh, written like this. So what is lambda? Lambda goes from the punctured unit disk into the Riemann sphere minus 0, 1, and infinity. And it's just the covering map, the uniformization. So there exists such a map, which corresponds. So this is a free group on two letters. You, uh, this is fundamental group, the free group on two letters. This is a covering space. And there's a holomorphic map. And there it is. That's lambda. And you can write it in terms of classical functions. Uh, psi 0 and psi 1 are, uh, again, in some sense, classical functions in the sense that they're hypergeometric functions. But these particular ones uh, came up uh, kind of more recently in, in relation to something that's called the mirror quintic. So I'll, I'll try to, to explain what that is. But it will take some time to explain what all these objects mean and what this has to do with Hodge theory and Lapinov exponents. But essentially, all the difficulties in the main theorem are expressed in this problem, in this statement that this function never vanishes. However, I don't think it's possible. At least I don't know of any proof that really works with these functions and proves anything uh, about this about non-vanishing by just looking at the function. So uh, this really non-vanishing, really it, it, it proves rather a conjecture of Eskin, Konsevich, Moller, and Zorich about a formula that involves Lapinov exponents, which are some invariants uh, from dynamics, and some other topological invariants, mu1 and mu2, which I'll uh, define. So they're just degrees of some vector bundles over some topological space. So they're something uh, from topology. And then the Lapinov exponents are really some dynamical concepts. So I'll try to uh, first explain what are these Lapinov exponents and how do they relate to Hodge theory. So, uh, OK, so, 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 this, uh, so this particular formula is in one very particular local system over 0, 1, and infinity. So I'll explain in a moment what Lapinov exponents are. So this formula is just one instance of, uh, or rather, this statement on the top half is one instance of when this formula holds. There are at least six more instances when it holds. Uh, I'll try to explain you know, wh 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 you know, what are these instances. Like, so I'll, I'll try to explain the context in which this is true. 
there's a context in which this is false, and I think it's it'll, it'll, it'll be interesting to figure out what, what is the border and why it happens. And but before I do that, let, let me try to explain what are Lapinov exponents. So Lapinov exponents are really a, a concept that goes back uh, a long time to just the beginning of uh, calculus in some sense. But so suppose that you have a, an ordinary differential equation. So you have a vector that depends on uh, you know, time, and its evolution is given by a differential equation where you have a matrix that depends on time, and you, you, the derivative of the vector is given by a formula. You apply the matrix to the vector. So that's just a regular ordinary differential equation. So you are interested in what happens for a long time. So if, you, if t is very large, what is the behavior of, this, uh, of the solutions of this differential equation? And so uh, what you typically expect doesn't have to be always the case, but oftentimes it is. Uh, it's the case that the vector v of t grows exponentially at some rate lambda 1. So there's some number lambda 1 such that the typical solution of this differential equation grows at rate e to the lambda 1 times t. So that's roughly the size after time t. Uh, and by roughly, I really mean uh, essentially up to sub-exponential sub terms. So uh, you know, there could be polynomial factors in front and something even much larger than that. So, root t e to the lambda 1 times root t is negligible with respect to, for example, th this kind of asymptotics. Okay, so this is what, our, uh, wh what is the first Lapinov exponent. So uh, wh I'll try to explain what are several Lapinov exponents, but first, the, typ the typical situation that we'll be in is you have some hyperbolic surface, some finite volume hyperbolic surface, and gt is going to be the geodesic flow. And we're going to sample this matrix, this derivative matrix, using the geodesic flow. So we're going to have a function, essentially, on the entire uh, Riemann surface. And then the geodesic flow is going to move around on the surface and pick up this matrix in some way. And so we're going to try to solve this OD on this uh, matrix, uh, on, on this uh, finite volume hyperbolic surface. So now, how do we sample the matrix? So you start from a representation of uh, pi 1 of the fundamental group of the surface into some uh, matrix group. So you, you just have this representation. And then you, from this, you can create a local system, which just means the following. So let me draw a picture. So suppose that this is your surface. So maybe it has some cusps. So suppose you fix a base point. So you have your vector space uh, here above this point. And now you move along a geodesic, a hyperbolic geodesic, and you come back not far from where you started. Now, what this representation tells you, it tells you that your vector, so you, if you parallel transport, so locally along this geodesic, you identify this Rn with this Rn. But as you go around the loop, you apply a matrix in, uh, given by this representation. So you can think of this V rho as a vector bundle with a flat connection or as a local system, or basically the data of representation of the fundamental group into some GLNR. So this is how we're going to sample the matri matrices. And so what we're interested in is uh, what happens when you take one random geodesic and you go around for a very long time, and you want to understand how the typical solution grows. So I said uh, Lapinov exponents. So the other Lapinov exponents are really defined. Yeah, so as I said, you'll have a growth rate like this if you move around a vector now. And if you take exterior powers of the representation, then you'll get uh, a sequence of Lapinov exponents that, is, that are determined by this uh, formula. So if you take the second exterior power, the growth rate is going to be bigger than the f uh, first exterior power. It will be given by some number, some expression, which determines what lambda 2 is. So if you know lambda 1, and you know lambda 1 plus lambda 2, and you can compute lambda 2. So then you get a sequence. So, so maybe uh, to say just in terms of the ODE, maybe that, that's maybe a little bit easier. Uh, you really have not just a vector solution. You can find the fundamental matrix of solutions. So you'll have a, a fundamental matrix. And what you look at is essentially the, the eigenvalues, but not really the eigenvalues, but rather what are called the singular values. So this is a concept from linear algebra. You, you, for, for, for a representation, for Lapinov exponents, what's important is really the singular values and not the eigenvalues. But for typical matrices, these, these are comparable. And certainly, in the regime that we're looking at, where we're taking logs and dividing by, very, by the time, essentially, the difference almost disappears, but not, not entirely. So if you don't know what singular values are, just think eigenvalues. But 
no, so v is in the v, v is in just so the tangent space is two dimensional. This could be a hundred. The, the vector space could be a hundred dimensional. Uh, yeah, what do you mean? This one? Yeah, so I mean, I, I pick a vector v in this fiber in this Rn. So it's in some big Rn, and then I move it around on the two-dimensional surface. And then it comes back. I, I have to apply the monodromy matrix to the result. So this is essentially what uh, Lapinov exponents are, and they're much studied in dynamics. So how, the, uh, yeah, so these, these are the Lapinov exponents. So it's not just one. Uh, lambda and A. Okay, a. a. So the matrix A, uh, so, so, so the way I kind of presented it, the matrix A seems to have disappeared because here there's almost no identification, right? Uh, the, the connection is flat. It seems like the vector is not moving. But, but there is an ODE. yeah, there, there's an ODE. There's a matrix a. Yeah, there's a matrix A. No, so these are not the eigenvalues of A. I mean, they really measure the long-term behavior of your differential equation. So typically, it can be very hard to read off the, um, the long-term behavior. Like what it, so typically, figuring out what these numbers are is, uh, can be tricky because your matrix, you know, your OD can be, for, for a while, it can be expanding in one direction, and another, for another time, it will expand in another direction. So then you, you won't really know what is the rate of expansion by just looking at the OD. You kind of have to run it to, to understand what's going on. No, so, 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 uh, so, so, so I'm giving, yeah, I'm giving you an example of how this setup, where this setup applies. So the setup is that we, we need a matrix, we need to sample a matrix. And we need to a flow, right? We need to evolve in time. And we're going to evolve in time by moving using the hyperbolic geodesic flow. And the matrix is going to be essentially given by this local system. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, on, uh, it, and this is an action, uh, really a vector bundle. So, so if I start with a vector in here and a path, which is given by the geodesic, I can move around this vector along the geodesic. The, so we have a representation row. And Are so you it's. Saying that hyperbolic structure, or is this just any representation? So the representation is absolutely unrelated to the hyperbolic structure. Fine. Fine. You, have, you fix some representation of the fundamental group that gives you a vector bundle. By parallel transport. Yeah. So, uh, so that's so the representation and the geodesic flow are completely separated. They're two completely different pieces of data. Okay. So. Uh, sorry. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's by parallel transport. It's it's unique. Yes, from the flat bundle structure. Okay, so so now so the, so far the, this is all kind of dyna uh, purely uh, dynamical systems. So now uh, to connect it to more complex geometry and algebraic geometry. So suppose that you have an algebraic variety, as you know, uh, or as you might know, its cohomology, which is a purely topological concept, has this PQ decomposition into uh, the different uh, Hodge subspaces. Now, if you have a family. Uh, of uh, algebraic varieties, then I you get exactly the, uh, at least one part of the input. So suppose that you have a family over the Riemann surface. You have a family of uh, algebraic varieties coming from somewhere. Then in particular, you get a representation of the fundamental group of the surface by acting on the cohomology of the fibers. So if you have now, instead of this vector space, you have a, some variety, you linearize it by taking its cohomology. And so you can now parallel transport the cohomology spaces as opposed to uh, the, the variety. But uh, so this row is a purely topological piece of data, but the Hodge subspaces are some holomorphic subbundles that really interact with this topological information. And they give you, they put all sorts of constraints on um, 
on this uh, on this topological representation. Okay, so um, so what are the properties of this? So that, or how, how does this interact with Rapinov exponents? So the the first case that kind of uh, came up uh, historically was when Zorich did some numerical experiments and then Konsevich kind of connected this to Hodge theory and then Giovanni Forni also uh, de developed this a lot further and in particular proved uh, rigorously some formulas that I'll show you in a moment. So this, the weight one situation when you have a family of Riemann surfaces over, for example, another fixed base, in this case, your cohomology, the middle cohomology, is 2G dimensional. So a Riemann surface of genus G has H1 2G dimensional and has a G dimensional space of 1, 0 forms and uh, the complex conjugate subspace of 0, 1 forms, holomorphic 1, 0 forms. So in this case, uh, these Lapinov exponents in general are some random numbers, but what, uh, so there are 2G numbers. Uh, they ha have a, an extra symmetry because uh, the group here, so on the cohomology you have a symplectic intersection form. So a symplectic matrix has a symmetry in the eigenvalues. If, if x is an eigenvalue of a symplectic matrix, then 1 over x is also an eigenvalue. So once you take logs, then you'll have that if lambda is a Lapinov exponent, so is minus lambda. So you really have g numbers instead of two g numbers. And in general, they're completely random, but uh, what Zorich kind of discovered first experimentally was that if you take their sum, then actually you get a rational number this is what was observed first experimentally, but then uh, there was a formula for this rational number, and this rational number turned out to be essentially the degree of this Hodge bundle uh, and divided by the Euler characteristic of the base. What's the degree? Sorry? What's the degree? Of H10. Uh, you just take the top exterior power, and that's a line bundle, and take the degree of that. Yeah. So for, for simplicity, I'm always assuming that I'm over some. Uh, one-dimensional base so that the degree makes is unambiguous. But in general, one has to, yeah. So in general, one has to, to be a little bit more careful about the degree. So this is what happens for uh, uh, the simplest case of what are called weight one uh, Hodge structures. So if you have weight two, then now you have three subspaces, this two, zero, one, one, and zero, two. And uh, basically, the short story is that there is a similar kind of formula. So, but now you have, uh, this is a formula for the first d exponents. And in total, there are two d non-zero exponents. You only have a formula for the first d. And uh, again, it's a rational number. So when d is 1, I did this. And then for all d, Matteo Constantini. And I also observed that uh, the, the similar kind of formula uh, can be done, can be proved. So then the interesting part is uh, when you have a weight 3 variation of Hodge structures, so then uh, in this case, you have the following. Uh, so I'll, I'll restrict to the simplest example where you have just three subspaces, uh, four subspaces, H30, H21, H12, and H03, and they have these dimensions, 1, 1, 1, and 1. So there are four spaces, uh, four, that's a four-dimensional space. There are two Lapinov exponents. Uh, I take it back, there are four Lapinov exponents, but because you have the symmetry, there is lambda 1, lambda 2, and then minus lambda 1 and minus lambda 2. So then uh, what Eskin, Konsevich, Moller, and Zorich proved was that what you have is, in general, a priori, you only have a bigger than or equal to situation. So this lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is bigger than or equal to this uh, expression using the Hodge bundles. And uh, this is, is essentially all you can get by using the, uh, the, the sort of older methods. And um, of course, so the result is much more general, but the, the, it's kind of a general principle that these Lapinov exponents can be bounded from below by topological information. But in this particular case of weight three, uh, this question, question arose for, as to when, when does one actually have equality? And this is a question not just in weight three. So, uh, not really, but you can think of just two mu one as degree H three zero over chi. And so it's those terms appropriately normalized. So then uh, the following thing happened. So Maxim Konsevich ran some numerical experiments on some very concrete, basically there are these 14 families uh, of representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann sphere minus three points into the symplectic group. Uh, there are just 14 explicit representations. It's just specifying two matrices. So you can just plug them in into a computer and uh, try to compute these Lapinov exponents numerically and see if they come out to what the uh, the formula predicts, 
And what he found was that uh, in seven cases, the formula holds, and in seven other cases, the formula is a strict inequality. So this was uh, a little bit puzzling. And then um, at some point, there was a conjecture that if you, see the, if you look at this blue line, then everything for So these 14 families, they really come into a two-parameter family that depends on two real numbers, mu1 and mu2. So those numbers, mu1 and mu2, really are coordinate axes on this picture. And for every mu1 and mu2, you have a representation. But it's going to be not into the integer matrices, but into real matrices. For specific values of mu1 and mu2, you'll actually land, or rather, you'll be conjugate into something integral. But in general, it's going to be just a real representation. Still, it will underlie some variation of Hodge structures. And you can kind of run uh, compute the same kind of computations. And you can ask, is this formula true or not? So at first, it was conjectured that anywhere above that blue line, the formula holds. Uh, but then Charles Foudron performed much more accurate experiments. And basically, what he found was that, so if you look at the blue dots, that's where the formula is expected to hold. And at the red dots is where the formula, the inequality is supposed to be strict, roughly. And you might notice that around the blue line, there are some little, there are some blue dots. But then he actually ran much more uh, accurate experiments just on that specific blue line. And it seems like the formula is true only at a countable set of points along the blue line. So if you look at the kind of defect from the formula, it looks something like this. So there are these points where the formula seems to hold, and the points accumulate towards the upper right corner. But in general, it's not true. At, so it's, there's no open set where it's expected that this formula is true, at least on, on this line. So uh, on, on the upper part, it's not true. So, uh, so there are these seven cases which are good and seven cases which are bad. And uh, so kind of parallel to this whole story, uh, people looking uh, at there's this notion of thin groups. So if you have a representation into a matrix group, an integral matrix group, you can ask, uh, when is this representation? When does it have finite index inside the full um, integer group or infinite index? So uh, what turned out to be the case is that the seven good cases are when the matrix group is infinite index. So this representation has infinite index in the symplectic group, integer symplectic, integer symplectic group. And in seven other cases, when the representation has finite index. So that's called the arithmetic monodromy, meaning that the really you're up to some finite index. You're really almost surjecting onto this symplectic matrices. Then you have strict inequality. And so this was proved uh, independently by Daniel Deron, uh, Dan uh, Jeremy Daniel and Bertrand Deron. And then uh, I have a uh, proof by slightly different methods. And what I'd like to talk about uh, for the rest of this uh, talk is uh, about the equality case. So wh what is the geometry that really kind of forces this equality? And how does it bring together uh, a bunch of different uh, concepts? So uh, b before I, I try to uh, explain the, uh, w what goes into the proof, I want to explain, maybe just to connect to maybe Drawer and Alex's uh, mini courses, w what does one really have to show? So, uh, so let me say that this is the uniformization of your Riemann surface. This is the unit disk. And this is your Riemann surface. Uh, finite volume, it could have some cusps. So to, t to consider a typical geodesic on this surface is basically the same as to consider a big ball of hyperbolic radius r in the uniformization. And when you're interested in the growth on the boundary, uh, yeah, when you're interested in the growth on the boundary, you would like to, uh, you know, so the, the, the place where holomorphic geometry comes in is that when you try to compute the norm of a vector, or at least the average norm of a vector on such a boundary, uh, and in particular, you're interested not in the average of the uh, vector itself, but the log of the norm of the vector, you can, using integration by parts, you can really compare it with the integral of dd bar log of, of log of that vector. So using a, a little integration by part, you can uh, reduce it to understanding the behavior of some subharmonic function on a larger and larger disk. So uh, in general, the subharmonic function will give you the degree of some uh, vector bundle. 
So it will be the curvature of some vector bundle if it's a line bundle. But oftentimes, uh, so a subharmonic function can have logarithmic poles. And so this, uh, these logarithmic poles come up when uh, certain subspaces are not transverse. So when you have some non-transversality, you'll get some, when you kind of run this machinery, you'll get some logarithmic poles. And essentially, what you want to exclude is uh, some kind of non-transversality happening very often. But in fact, the way uh, the problem kind of comes out is that it either happens all the time or it doesn't happen at all. So, so there's some transversality that one needs to check. And somehow, in all the previous cases, the transversality kind of followed by some just pure linear algebra. There are some uh, complex subspaces and real subspaces, and they just could never intersect by some reality, by some condition that something was real. But uh, in this way three case is the first case when there's no a priori reason why this shouldn't happen, and there are exactly seven cases when it fails and seven cases when, it hap when it, it's true. So, uh, so, for now, so, so from now on, I'll, I'll just try to explain what, uh, what we're trying to avoid and why it doesn't happen. But before that, I, I need to explain what are hypergeometric equations. So this is the oldest, uh, the first hypergeometric equation. So it's called the Gauss hypergeometric equation, and it's just a differential equation for a function. Of, it's a differential equation of degree 2. And uh, th there it is. It, it's a function of the variable z and has an explicit solution. So what's nice about the solution is that it has many, you can understand it in several different ways. One is as an explicit power series. So I, I wrote the formula over there, uh, these symbols a and So a, b, and c are parameters, and then this a n means a, a plus 1, dot, 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 a plus n minus 1. So it's a, something like a factorial, but not really beginning at 1. So you have a, a power series expression like this. You also have an integral expression, like the one I wrote down there, which you can look up in a book. I don't think it oftentimes explains what, what's going on. And uh, there's a more geometric understanding of what it does using the Schwarz reflection principle. So what uh, Schwarz showed essentially is that using, in fact, not just one, but two. So it's a degree two equation. So there are two solutions. And uh, you can think of this, uh, these two solutions as giving you a map to P1, to the Riemann sphere. And if you think about uh, where 0, 1, and infinity are mapped, they're mapped to some points in the limit. And then the horizontal axis, the real axis, is mapped into the edges of a rectangle. Of, of a triangle, and the angles, so th these are uh, uh, circles on this Riemann sphere, and these triangles, uh, the angles here in that these uh, edges form, so these uh, angles you can compute in terms of A, B, and C. And in fact, you can analytically continue the solution using Schwarz reflection. So you have a geometric understanding of what this differential equation also looks like. Okay, so the general case, so you can consider these uh, hypergeometric equations for all n, and uh, it's an equation that looks like this. Now it depends on not just three parameters, a, b, and c, but rather a family at two n parameters, uh, alpha i and beta i, beta j. Uh, and for the particular case that uh, we're interested in, and, and that I, uh, where these seven families occur, uh, so the parameters beta are all zero, which means that, uh, so, so I, uh, I didn't talk about monodromy. So this equation is really, as I said, defined on the Riemann sphere minus three points. So you have zero, one, and infinity. So it's a differential equation. And wh wh what is the monodromy of a differential equation? So in each patch away from these singular points, there's, a, there's always a four, uh, there's, a, there's always a, uh, a basis of solutions. However, if you analytically continue these solutions around the loop, then uh, you're going to come back and you're going to see a different basis of solutions. So this transition matrix is what gives you the uh, the transition matrix is, is what gives you this representation, this monodromy. And uh, for example, you can understand the Schwarz reflection uh, the Schwarz reflection picture that I had earlier as composition of these monodromy matrices as you're traveling in the fundamental domains. And uh, the condition that all the beta parameters are zero means that the monodromy around zero, so this monodromy, is maximally unipotent, which means that it's a unipotent matrix, and it's such that uh, basically it can be conjugated to one, 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 
so a four by four matrix can be unipotent in many different ways, but maximally unipotent means that they're all ones here. It's a full Jordan block. Okay. So uh, and then the parameters mu one and mu two have to uh, so the alpha parameters have to satisfy this extra symmetry that they have to be symmetric with respect to one minus uh, like with this reflection. So then you really have only two effective parameters mu one and mu two, which I plotted earlier, and the particular case that we're interested in is what's called the mirror quintic example. So this arose first in kind of string theory, and people use this for enumerative geometry. But is the following kind of concrete situation. You have a family of projective threefold, so complex three-dimensional manifolds in P4, which are uh, cut out by this equation. So xi are the variables and t is the parameter. And uh, these are, they, they have high, uh, high degree cohomology. So I think it's 200 and, I forget, 202 or something like that in the middle degree. So H3 is the 200 something dimensional. But there's a lot of symmetry. And effectively, uh, once you account for all the symmetry, there's only uh, a four-dimensional subspace that's, uh, that, that, that's really interesting. And this four-dimensional subspace exactly corresponds to this hypergeometric equation for the values mu1 and mu2, one-fifth and two-fifths. So it's this very concrete uh, object. And the functions that, you, uh, that I had on the first slide, these psi0 and psi1, they're essentially the integrals of a holomorphic Three form this omega three zero. There's a way to write down an explicit rational holomorphic uh, uh, three form, uh, and there are two cycles gamma zero and gamma one, which are defined exactly near this singular point. So above each point around here, there's a six a real a complex three dimensional manifold, and there's some homology, homology class gamma zero, and you integrate this ex three form. You cannot evaluate that integral explicitly. However, you know that this integral will satisfy a differential equation of this hypergeometric type. So uh, it's, it's something, uh, again, uh, you know, th there are these kind of abstract theories of uh, variations of height structure. And then you can make them very explicit and get actual differential equations in, uh, in this particular case. These are hypergeomet the hypergeometric equations. So why are these groups uh, infinite index in the symplectic group? So this was proved by uh, Brav and Thomas. And what they did was the following. So I'll, I'll just show you in this concrete example. So I'll, I'll use this mirror quintic as a running example. So you have two matrices. There is T and there is R. So R is a finite order matrix. And what uh, Brav and Thomas basically showed is that these two matrices play ping pong. So they found two T invariant cones, C plus and C minus, which uh, are, have, have an invariance property. So I'll just show you the picture, and then I'll uh, explain what, what the cones are. So T in this picture, so T acts on, is a real four by four matrix. It, it acts on projective three space you know, on P3. And then having these cones in, in R4 is the same as giving a, essentially a polyhedron in R, uh, RP3, right? So this is a chart in RP3, which the chart I took to be just R3, and I took some particular point at uh, plane at infinity. So then these two cones, you have C plus and C minus. And then if you apply the transformation, so T acts by uh, transition shifting to the left. And then if you apply T inverse, it goes to the right. And then these cones are taken into themselves. So if I apply T, you're shifting the left cone into itself. If you apply T inverse, you shift the right cone into itself. If you apply R to these two cones, you get, so you, you can apply R up to four times. And you'll get eight cones, which will form, uh, which will form this little kind of polyhedral curve that connects the edges of these two uh, other polyhedra. And uh, now if you apply T, then T is going to take these eight red uh, polyhedra into the blue cone. And if T inverse is going to take them back. So what, basically this, tell, what this basically tells you is that uh, the group gamma acts as a free group. It, it's group theoretically. Not, uh, so it, it, you know, yeah, group theoretically, it's isomorphic to the free group, to the free product of basically Z and Z mod 5. Because you've explicitly showed this. Uh, ping, so in group, geometric group theory, this is called a ping pong argument. You've kind of ex exhibited these fundamental domains on which the group acts in a very understandable way. So this is what uh, Brav and Thomas did. So th there's a little uh, amusing extra piece that one can do here. So I, I don't know if the, 
it's possible that this was known in the literature, but it turns out that these uh, matrices also have an extra reflection structure. This is a general feature of hypergeometric equations once you impose certain conditions. So in fact, you have these matrices A, B, and C, and they are, each of them is an order two matrix. So A squared is one, B squared is one, and C squared is one. But uh, these uh, monodromy matrices factor as these reflections, uh, as, yeah, as these reflections. And in fact, these, but what's interesting is that these matrices A, B, and C are not symplectic matrices. They're really reflections in uh, this family of Lagrangians. So what, what you have is you have R, uh, Z, Z4 or Q4, and then you have two Lagrangian subspaces, which are transverse, and then you can act you can get the transformation by acting by plus one on one Lagrangian and by minus one on the other Lagrangian. This is not going to be a symplectic transformation, but it's going to be almost in the sense that the symplectic pairing of any two vectors will change sign typically under such a transformation. So it's kind of a subgroup, which it's a group which contains the symplectic group with index two. No, no, no not the free group, but rather the hypergeometric parameters. So it's not, it's not always going to be true for all. So I had these alphas and betas. So you have a similar factorization for alphas and betas satisfying certain symmetries. Uh, so here I, I happen to have integral matrices, but you have this thing kind of at the real picture. As well. uh, there, there's a real version of this. Uh, no, no, it's a structure of the hypergeometric equation, not of the symplectic group. So it, it's really related to the Schwarz reflection principle. Okay, so maybe I'll uh, skip this. Okay, so, so now I'm, try I'm getting a little bit closer to what I had on the first slide. So we have these uh, limit sets. So wh what is the limit set? So you have this group acting on projective uh, three space. So the limit set the, is the kind of concept that is, because it's so useful, it has many different definitions. So one definition is that it's the smallest closed invariant subset uh, closed subset that's invariant on the, the group gamma, which is acting on this projective space. And in this particular case, it, it, you can check once you have these uh, ping pong uh, polyhedra, then you can check that it's a non-trivial subset. It's not just uh, any subset. So this is a picture of this set. So I, I wanted to uh, show you, uh, just a second. Yeah, so here, so this is the, yeah. So you, you can see how this set looks like. So if you look at it, unfortunately, this picture is not uh, very representative, but this turns out to be a curve. So if you look at it from this uh, angle, it's a, it's a spiral that's kind of uh, it's spiraling. If you look at it transversely, it looks so it, it doesn't quite exactly match up. It has this kind of funny structure. What's really uh, one of the reasons why this set is a little bit difficult to visualize is because it's it's not one of these uh, conformal fractals. So the typical fractals that you've seen in uh, popular culture are these Mandelbrot sets or Julia sets. So those are invariant under conformal transformations, which if you zoom in to a piece of the fractal, it will look roughly the same as the entire fractal. But here, this, gr uh, this guy, uh, this limit set is invariant under a group of transformations that's not conformal. So in order to get the same picture, you shouldn't zoom in and take a little cube of equal sides near some point, but rather you have to take a parallelepiped that's very degenerate in some directions. And then if you zoom in and you rescale that, then, then you'll get a similar looking picture. But th this one, so th this limit set is not invariant uh, under conformal groups, so th this is why it's kind of, if you zoom into it, you you'll see a different picture. But it's not because, uh, yeah, it's, it's because the, 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 the invariance is under a different kind of group. It's a, it's a higher rank group. So I guess what I should say is that this theory of higher rank groups, uh, so going away from Kleinian groups, uh, so it only recently started to be studied more seriously. And so some of these peop the people who looked at this are Labrie. Uh, so he introduced these uh, Anosov representations about which I'll talk in a moment. And then there's Gishar and Wienhard and Cassell and Gerita. And there is a separate uh, group of people like Kapovich, Liebel, and Porti who are working on this. Okay, so once you have this limit set, uh, what you can do is you can consider in the Lagrangian Grassmannian, you can consider this kind of saturated version of the limit set. So for each point in uh, the limit set, you take all the Lagrangians which are not transverse to that point in the limit set. 
So the point the limit set is a line in R4, and uh, you look at all the Lagrangians which are not transverse, so which contain that line, and uh, you call this the saturated limit set. So, so if you had a curve in R4, then this will give you something like a tube in uh, this Lagrangian Grassmannian. So the Lagrangian Grassmannian is uh, three-dimensional uh, for R4, so it's going to be some real three-dimensional manifold, and you'll have this kind of cylinder sitting inside. So uh, the, uh, now you take the complement of this closed subset, and then you get an open subset, which is some non-trivial open subset. And this is going to be the domain of discontinuity of, uh, so it's, you can call it the domain of discontinuity, but the fact is that gamma acts on uh, this limit, uh, on this domain of discontinuity pro properly discontinuously. So once you've thrown away these bad points, then you actually get a properly discontinuous action. So uh, the, the, uh, the problem is that, so the, these people uh, in, in the theory of Anosov representations, they really study groups which have only hyperbolic elements. So the action is always kind of luxodromic. You always have non-trivial eigenvalues and the dynamics is always uniformly hyperbolic in some sense. But here you have unipotence. So the monodromy around cusps is always unipotent. So you have to uh, kind of extend a little bit the notions that they, they used to, to prove such, such a result. So you, you have to mess around with this. OK, so this so far was all topological. So how does this rela relate to Hodge theory? So uh, if we go back to the Hodge decomposition, so you take the first two subspaces in the Hodge decomposition. So uh, you call that F2. So that's a traditional name in uh, Hodge theory. Uh, Essentially, because this F2 bundle, it actually is what varies holomorphically. So H30 varies holomorphically, but H21 doesn't vary holomorphically. However, their direct sum, which you call F2, will vary holomorphically. So then uh, what do you do? You associate to this. So maybe remember, what are we trying to do? We're trying to establish some kind of transversality that happens. So what you do is the following. You take the to each such possible element of the Hodge filtration, you associate a subset of the real Grassmannian, which are the bad real Lagrangians. So what are the bad real Lagrangians? So you have this C4, and you have a subspace F2, which happens to be also Lagrangian. And you consider those real Lagrangians, which, if you complexify, they are not transverse to this uh, com complex F2. So this is a codimension, complex codimension 1 condition, or a real codimension 2 condition. So this gives you actually a curve inside the, this real three-dimensional Lagrangian Grassmannian. So now you can consider over the surface, you can consider this kind of bad bundle. So what is it? So the fiber over a point on the Riemann surface uh, on C, uh, P1 minus three points, so the fiber is just the Lagrangian. So it's a circle bundle, which is the circle of all Lagrangians which are bad for that specific holomorphic, uh, holomorphically varying piece of the Hodge filtration. So now uh, wh what you can show is that this bad uh, bundle, it actually is uniformized by this uh, domain of discontinuity that we had earlier. So this group gamma, as I said, it acts properly discontinuously. This is a, kind of a purely topological picture on, on the Lagrangian Gassmannian, on this open set. And then this open set identifies with this, once you quotient by gamma, it identify, identifies with this bad with a space of bad Lagrangian, which is kind of something that really comes from holomorphic geometry. So, once you, uh, so uh, yeah, I should say that the, uh, Collier, uh, Tolzan, and Toulouse, they did something uh, similar, but again, kind of in the context of Anosov representations. And uh, yeah, it, it, so in particular, it, so it, it, there is not this non compactness, and the, the cusps are absent, but and it's in a slightly different language of Higgs bundles, but I think it's, it's kind of similar in spirit. But so once you have this, you're basically done. <clears throat> because what you get is that this Lagrangian, which you had here, so remember now uh, around zero, we had this monodromy, uh, which, had, which was maximal, maximal unipotent. So in particular, it had an invariant Lagrangian and it had an invariant line. So an invariant line, uh, for this monodromy will give you a point in the limit set, and the invariant Lagrangian will give you a point which lies on the circle associated to that limit set. So what you get is that this maximally unipotent Lagrangian is never bad for any of these filtrations, for any of these Hodge filtrations, because this uh, maximally unipotent Lagrangian belongs to this complement of the, uh, of, of the limit set. 
So, uh, so, so maybe I can, I can state it kind of geometrically. So you, you have the Riemann sphere minus three points. So here it is. And you have this F2 subspace, which is varying over this, uh, over this picture. So now near zero, you fix this one Lagrangian subspace. And then you start flatly moving it around all over the surface. And then it comes back to itself many, many times using non-trivial monodromy transformations. And basically, the claim is that it will never intersect the holomorphic, uh, th this F2 term of the filtration. So it will always stay transverse. So once you have this transversality, essentially, yeah, so, so what I said is that this function that I described, it will never vanish. So there's an explicit way to express this uh, non-vanishing. It's uh, this transversality as some non-vanishing of some matrix coefficient. And you can explicitly write it out using power series. And the, it's kind of amusing. You can write it out explicitly, and you'll get that some random integers will, or rational numbers will have to have some rate of decay. You know, there's a power series that doesn't have any zeros in, in the unit disk, so its inverse has no poles, so it has a very good radius of, so the coefficients have to converge very quickly. But in any case, this was uh, just something related to Lapinov exponents. There's a lot more what can, one can get from this. So uh, if you take G to be, the, again, the real symplectic uh, four-dimensional group, and H to be the unit indefinite unitary subgroup. So H, what I want to emphasize here is that H is not a compact subgroup. So H is non-compact. However, what's true is that uh, the group, the discrete group gamma acts properly discontinuously on this G mod H. So you have, uh, so gamma is a discrete subgroup of G, but H is not compact. So uh, th there's, in general, no reason for, for why a discrete subgroup should act uh, properly discontinuously. In fact, there's a criterion of Benoit which tells you when this happens. And uh, again, one can check it uh, rather explicitly in this, in this case. So again, uh, the name as I put down there, so Gary To, Guichard, Cassel, and Wienhardt, they have some rather general theorems which are in this spirit. But again, somehow they always work with purely loxodromic elements. So one has to adapt some of these proofs when, when you have unipotence. But what is the space G mod H? It's, this, it's the Lagrangian uh, Grassmannian of these indefinite, so these F2 terms of the Hodge filtration. So, uh, so it's a complex manifold in particular. And what you have is that basically using this thin, these thin subgroups of uh, the symplectic group, you can construct a complex three-dimensional manifold, uh, which in principle, there, there's no reason why it should be there. So you have some complex three-dimensional three -dimensional manifold by just taking the quotient by gamma. And what's amusing about this complex three-dimensional manifold is that if you um, take the, uh, so it has this, so if you fix the real uh, Lagrangian, you consider inversely all the, if you fix the real Lagrangian, you consider all the term Hodge filtrations, which are bad, which are not transverse with respect to this one fixed real subspace. So this is a complex co-dimension one condition on this complex three-dimensional manifold. And what you get is that you have this, threefold, and inside you have a complex divisor, and you have also a curve, and they are disjoint. So being disjoint is essentially, the fact that these two things are disjoint is essentially equivalent to the previous theorem that when you do this parallel transport, the, these guys are always transverse. So now you have this threefold, and inside you have a divisor, and you have a curve, and it would be interesting to understand more about the geometry of this threefold, in particular, you know, what, what, can one build interest, other interesting, for example, holomorphic functions on this uh, complex three manifold? Uh, all right, so, so let me uh, conclude. So th the first kind of takeaway that I uh, would like to make is that, first of all, you can study uh, these period maps that come from Hodge theory in this kind of global way by trying to understand the global geometry. So most of the time, people study this by looking at the differential geometry, the infinitesimal picture, but they have these large scale properties which can be interesting. So uh, one can prove, so this is one thing I didn't talk about, which is that one can prove classical theorems in Hodge theory using some ideas from uh, dynamics. And in particular, uh, the, the advantage is that this applies to a more general setting. So maybe Alex will talk about it in, the, in his mini course. Uh, so in particular for foliations and in Takimura dynamics, you, you can use the tools of Hodge theory to uh, prove versions of these theorems in Hodge theory, which don't really apply a a as, as they were classically proved. So they don't, they don't apply in somehow these foliated settings. And the Tecmo setting, but using ideas from Hodge theory, you can kind of implement them. Another uh, direction is uh, 
the, uh, the topic of thin groups, so this is something that especially people in number theory have looked at a lot, but they have interesting asymptotic properties, and especially when they come from some kind of geometry, like, uh, for example, Hodge theory. So you can control their asymptotic properties quite precisely, and you can make geometric statements about their behavior. Uh, the other thing is that, so th there's this parallel theory of Anasov representations, and one would need to kind of deal with these unipotents that appear most of the time when you have families of uh, algebraic manifolds. There's always unipotent monodromy that you have to understand. So you would need some kind of notion of, so I, I, don't, know, I don't think this is standard terminology, but you could call these log Anasov representations. So in, an, in the Anasov picture, you, you always have some kind of linear divergence of uh, some eigenvalue, eigenvalues or singular values. Here you only get kind of logarithmic divergence, but you can still recover many of the conclusions of that uh, theory, even though the assumptions are not d directly satisfied. But if you allow unipotence, then you can work with these objects. And finally, you, you get these new interesting geometric objects, like this complex three-dimensional manifold, which is really, it's locally homogeneous. Uh, it comes from this group gamma, but w what are its properties and uh, w what does it mean? Like, w what can one do with it is, uh, I think, something that re remains to be kind of discussed. So I think nobody's going to complain if I end a little bit early. So I'll end here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I didn't say much about the flat surfaces. Uh, I mean, I. I uh, yeah. So, so, so uh, the, the situation I was in, in fact, for most of the talk was just the Riemann sphere minus three points with a hyperbolic metric, and the geodesic flow on that. And you have an explicit representation of the fun fundamental group of the Riemann sphere minus three points. That's a free group on two letters. I wrote two matrices at some point. So there's those two matrices. They have a lot of rather remarkable properties in the sense like they have, you can derive a lot of interesting objects just from essentially two explicit matrices. Can you yeah. say a little bit more about this space M theory and why it's, so why it's the thing to consider? Uh, this one? Oh, uh, here, yeah. So, so, so in, in this case, uh, so I mean, I think maybe from the perspective of, uh, so if you take the second exterior power of this, uh, of this thing, then uh, w w w what you'll get is, uh, right, so, so what, what happens is that the other part is F2, there's F2 and there's F2 bar. And uh, F2 bar is just the other two guys. And uh, for example, if you take the exterior power, F2 will give you one complex vector. And then F2 bar will give you the complex conjugate vector. And together, they will give you, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, a, a, a negative definite. Yeah, there's always the question of like norm normalizing the, the sign. But no, if, if, uh, here, in fact, it's unambiguous. Regardless of how you normalize it, it's always going to be, I think, negative definite. Uh, so you'll have this negative definite two-dimensional subspace with a complex structure, essentially. So, uh, so from the point of view of the question that I was interested in, which was this computing this, these Lapinov exponents, this is somehow the space that you want to naturally avoid. But I think y y one can express it in terms, like, th there's a different parallel story if you replace SP4 by SO2, 3 which is isomorphic, and then F2 has a, an expression there, which I think is uh, quite similar to wh what occurs, I think, in, in your paper. Uh, uh, yeah. But, but, but I guess maybe one, one little difference is that I think once you have this Hodge structure, it's just a little bit more extra information, but it's kind of convex information uh, on this second exterior power. Like, you have some bundles there, but here you have a little bit more data than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why this number? Fourteen. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, so, so the 14 is not uh, anything in particular. What happens is you have this family. You have these two real parameters, mu1 and mu2. And the values are in symplectic matrices. And you can write down explicitly what these matrices are. It's a formula in terms of mu1 and mu2. What Duran and Morgan did is they figured out which of, for which real parameters, mu1 and mu2, this representation can be entirely conjugated into the integral matrices. And they found 14 answers, and they showed that there are no other possibilities. You know a priori that there's a finite number, but the, the bounds that you get a priori are not very good. So they just computed which examples can be conjugated to integer matrices, and they found these 14 examples. But in, in fact, you, know, you can take uh, hypergeometric equations with like of degree 6 and 8 and so on. So there's like an infinite family. There will always, in each degree, there will be only finitely many integral such representations. Uh, but in fact, yeah, so, so, so if you want, for example, to get algebraic numbers, there's, in fact, infinitely many. If you want to conjugate it not into SP4Z, but SP4, you know, uh, some algebraic entries, and then uh, you can take Galois conjugate representations and so on, and then th those are actually also very interesting. And uh, somehow they, yeah, they, they actually lead to, a, like, even if you just want to stay in dimension four, there's a lot more geometry if you allow uh, non-integer entries. Further questions? Not at 